When did you become an expert in thermonuclear astrophysics? Last night. I've been diving into input lag the last couple of days, so that clip is definitely me only replaced thermonuclear astrophysics with uh, input lag. And the last couple of days I've been researching it, how to reduce it. And that's the whole point of this video. I'm going to talk about your peripherals, your settings in game, settings outside the game for both AMD and NVIDIA. Hopefully it'll be a really informative video. Um, as always, if you guys like the content, consider dropping a subscription. It really helps me out and it's free for you. Um, a like and a comment on the video also really helps out with the algorithm. So if you want to do that, it would also be appreciated. But let's jump into it and we will talk about input lag. When I talk about input lag in this video, I'm pretty much going to be talking about the total system end-to-end -end latency from when the user inputs something to something happening on the screen. So a lot of the time when you talk about input lag or um, just response times in general for monitors or peripherals or things like that, people always get that confused and they're like, no, you're wrong. You're, why is your input lag 50 milliseconds when you know my controller only has a one millisecond response time, so my input lag is only one millisecond? Well, it's not that simple. You can see the input on the left there, the mouse, or if you're using a controller, the controller is only a small part of the total end-to-end -to -end system latency. Um, there's all kinds of stuff in the PC latency, sampling, game engine, render queue, GPU, and composite. And then even after that, there's more where the that frame that was rendered on your PC has to be sent to the display. The display has to render it. Uh, there's a pixel response time involved. All this stuff takes time, and it all adds up. Um, to that total end-to-end -end system latency. That's what I'll be talking about most of the time. I am going to talk a little bit about controller uh, and mouse individual response time, so just those peripherals and how much they can affect this. Um, but overall, this video is basically going to be about how to reduce your total input lag, because if you think about it, input lag is extremely important. In a lot of ways, it's even more important than your frame rate. Obviously, frame rate plays a part in this, because the faster a frame is rendering over and over and over, um, the quicker that thing that you've done with your mouse or your controller will show up on the screen just because the frame will render quicker directly after that. So FPS does play a big part in this, but you'll be just surprised to learn that in a lot of cases, actually lowering your FPS can dramatically help your input lag. And input lag in a lot of ways is better and more important than FPS in my opinion, because uh, if you can't react to the way someone else is moving, uh, if you can't react to how your own movements are affecting like where your reticle is going and things like that, that's just a lot more important than FPS. FPS will make the game look smooth um, and make like quick movements and stuff. You'll still be able to track item, like objects on the screen. But overall, I think input lag is a little bit more important. Um, but it's not that simple. There's all kinds of factors involved in this, and that's what this video is going to be about. It's going to be a long one, but hopefully really, really informative. With all of that in mind, what can we actually improve? Which, which of these things can we actually have an effect on when we... Uh, are playing with settings or peripherals or, or monitors, things like that, what can we actually improve? So I've kind of highlighted the big ones that we can have an effect on. Uh, obviously, your mouse or your controller, you can buy a different controller. Um, you can overclock your controller, things like that. That all has an effect on your uh, input lag, end-to-end uh, -end latency. And then as far as PC latency, um, a big effect that I didn't really put in here because there's no specific block for it, but FPS, obviously, has a big effect. That'll be the first thing we're going to talk about on the next uh, the next slide here. But um, another thing we can affect is render queue. So I've highlighted that in red as well. This is That's what the big focus of this video. That's why I made this video. Um, so that'll be a big part of it as well. Uh, we'll come to that later. And then display latency. We can't really aff affect scan out and display processing. That's just kind of part of the monitor itself. Um, but pixel response time, that's something that you can you know purchase a faster monitor uh, with better pixel response times. You usually see like you know one millisecond gray to gray response time. Um, Again, that's not a big effect when your overall system latency is going to be between like 30 and 50 milliseconds. Um, but every little bit counts. So that's the whole point of this video is I'm going to go through each step and talk about how to get the minimum input lag uh, while balancing that with FPS. First thing I want to talk about is just the effect that frame rate has on input lag. So if you think about this, if you're running at 50 frames per second, um, that means 1 divided by 50 is going to be the amount of time between each frame. So if you look at this chart, the amount of time between each frame is plotted on the blue line uh, versus FPS on the x-axis. The vertical axis is milliseconds, so the time between each frame in milliseconds. Um, at, at 50 FPS, you have 20 milliseconds of time between frames. So if you think about what that means, um, say a frame is rendered and shows up on your screen, and then literally like just one-tenth of a millisecond after that, you move your mouse or you move your thumbstick. That means that you're not going to see that change happen 
until another 20 milliseconds has passed because that's the amount of time it takes between frames. And that's just assuming the frame rate alone is the only thing affecting that input lag. So um, if you take into consideration the fact that the point at which you move that mouse can be anywhere between right when the previous frame was rendered and right before the next frame is rendered, you need to take the average um, from zero up to that 20 milliseconds to get the red line, which is the average input lag. So at 50, uh, 50 FPS, you get exactly an average of 10 milliseconds of average input lag from your FPS. And you can see you get diminishing returns as your FPS goes up. So um, by the time you're up over about 150, you're only going to see about, you know, maybe one millisecond of increased or, or decreased input lag going all the way up to like 240 FPS. So you don't get very much benefit over 100, 150 FPS in terms of input lag. There's always a little bit of gain, but it's very, very diminishing in terms of, in terms of the amount of return you get on on those extra frames. So now that I've covered FPS and the effect, effect that has, I want to talk about the mouse's effect or the controller's effect. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have, you know, I don't have a PS4. I don't have an Xbox. I can't, I can't test these things on console. And I only have, uh, I have three different co controllers. I have an Xbox Elite Series Two. Um, I have the Thrustmaster. I don't remember what it's called, but it's the one that you can swap around your your inputs, which is pretty cool. And I have a standard Xbox One controller, so I don't even have a PlayStation controller. So this is not going to be too focused on that. But there's a bunch of other good information if you're using a controller in this video that's still very applicable to you. Um, so don't go away just because I don't have a whole bunch of controller information. I do have a bunch of mouse information, and this is not my own. This is from the, the YouTube channel Optimum Tech. Um, I'm going to put the link down to his channel as well as the video that this came from in my video description. This guy does incredible work. Um, he actually has an LDAT sensor, which is an input lag sensor that I don't have. Um, I'm able to get very consistent results similar to his LDAT results, um, but it's just an amazing channel. You should 100% go follow him, subscribe to him. Um, but this is just a table of his results for various mice. Um, he talked about this in the video. I'm just going to kind of paraphrase it. Um, there's not much difference at all between wireless and wired mice at this point. Uh, there's no significant difference in terms of input lag, input latency. Um, using either wireless or wired, so don't feel bad about using a wireless mouse at all. Um, you can see that there's some mice that do better than others in here. Um, I just switched over to the G Pro X Superlight, which is the third fastest mouse on this list. I didn't even know that when I bought it. I just, I know Logitech makes good mice, uh, and I just wanted something new, so that's what I grabbed. Um, but yeah, it doesn't matter if you're wired or wireless. One other thing that I do want to talk about is DPI. This is something that so many people get wrong. Um, and I'm going to try to dispel that in this video. I don't know if my camera's overheating or what. It's 97 degrees where I live today, and my room is really hot as well, but it keeps shutting off, so I'm just going to leave the camera off for the rest of the video. Um, but I wanted to talk about the effect that DPI of your mouse has on the overall input lag of the mouse. So, again, this is not my information. I didn't learn all this just, like, out of the blue. I watched other people's videos, and again, this came from a different YouTube channel called Battle Nonsense. Um, I thought it'd be better just to shout these guys out and tell you that they make incredible content. Seriously, both those channels make some of the best content uh, in the tech world that I've ever seen. Um, so definitely go drop Battle Nonsense a sub. And obviously, I'll link his his channel in the video this, this uh, chart came from down below. But anyway, what you can see from his chart here is the blue, the blue number is the average input lag at the given settings below the chart. So at 100 dpi, it was 31.69 milliseconds of uh, input lag when he moved the mouse. And then obviously going up to 200 dpi, dropped it down by about 8 milliseconds down to about 24 milliseconds. Dropping it to, or upping the dpi to 400, gave him another 7 milliseconds of gain. 800, another 5 milliseconds. 1600, about 2 milliseconds. And then going up to 1300, half a millisecond. So again, these are small differences. A lot of people, most people play on 800 dpi. Um, a lot of pros actually play on 400, and that's just because other people play on 400. There's no reason for that. Um, so that's what I'm trying to dispel in this video is that um, a lot of the things maybe you thought you understood or you're just following what other people do is not necessarily the best way to do it. So you should definitely set your mouse to either 1600 or 3200 DPI, 3200 if you want the absolute best response. Uh, the fastest response to moving the mouse would be at higher DPI numbers. 3200 is a good uh, upper bound. And then a lot of the time when I when I tell people to do this, they're like, oh, I don't like to do that because it makes my mouse move too fast in Windows and through the menus and stuff. All you have to do is go into the Windows mouse settings uh, and turn down your mouse 
speed in the Windows settings. That doesn't affect DPI. It just affects how uh, Windows like reads your mouse movement. Um, so that's what you want to do. Go change it in Windows if it's too fast for you in Windows. And then obviously, it scales linearly in-game. So if you're at 800 DPI right now, and you have four in-game cents, and you go up to 3200 DPI on your mouse, then you just need to change your in-game sensitivity from four down to one. You just divide it by four because 3200 over uh, 800 is going to be four. So you just divide whatever that number is, um, divide your, your in-game sensitivity by that number, and you'll get what your sensitivity should be. Um, another thing to note, in his video, he covers how the speed at which you're moving your mouse has a huge effect on uh, how much difference there is between like 100 DPI and 3200 DPI in terms of input lag. If you're moving your mouse super fast, like a flick motion, it makes almost no difference what DPI you're on. But for small, precise, slow movements, which is what this chart is showing, there's a dramatic effect on terms of uh, the overall input lag. So just wanted to spell some myths here. There's no reason not to put it on 1600 or 3200 DPI because it's just straight up a benefit. It just helps. There's no there's no downside to it. So definitely change your mouse settings 1600 or 3200 DPI. I want to quickly cover just the little bit that I know about controllers um, and explain the differences. So DualShock 4 and Xbox controller, they have different pulling like pulling rates by default. The DualShock 4 is 250 hertz, and the Xbox controllers are 125 hertz. So again, if you do all that math, uh, you, you you know do one divided by 250, one divided by 125, you get two milliseconds and four milliseconds respectively as average input lag, and that's because it ranges from zero to four uh, milliseconds of input lag at 250 hertz, and zero to eight milliseconds of input lag at 125 hertz. Um, so again, you get two milliseconds average with the DualShock 4, four milliseconds average with the Xbox. That's a very very small difference, but again, it's it's just we're just trying to make these things as as good as possible as low as possible because they all stack up they all add up um, as far as gaming mice gaming mice are generally uh, a thousand hertz pulling rate so that is uh, approximately half a millisecond on average of input lag but i do want to note that if you don't know about this dualshock 4 and xbox controllers at least on pc can both be overclocked to reach a thousand hertz so i don't know anything about that i'm not going to pretend to i'm not going to talk about it but if you want to do that, I'm sure there are a million videos on YouTube and guides online for how to uh, actually overclock your DualShock or your Xbox controller. Before we start getting into all the render queue settings and things that I'm going to mess with there to decrease input lag, I want to just talk about FreeSync, G-Sync, and V-Sync uh, and what they do and how frames just get to the monitor, monitor in general. Um, so I've got a really simplified diagram here to try to explain without any of those settings on, without FreeSync, G-Sync, or V-Sync on, what exactly happens when your GPU sends a frame to the monitor. So the, the monitor will refresh at a set cadence, and that is the refresh rate of the monitor, obviously. So if you have a 144 hertz monitor, the screen is refreshing itself 144 times per second, and it doesn't care what's being sent by the GPU. Um, even if it's a partially rendered frame, it will still display it because it's just displaying exactly what it has at the time the next tick happens of that 144 times per second. Um, what v FreeSync, G-Sync, V-Sync do is they all kind of sync up the process between the GPU and the monitor itself in order to uh, make it so you always have a full frame and you never have those uh, you know, partial frames. Partial frames lead to screen tearing. Um, you've all seen this. What it is is basically when a partial frame is rendered, you know, half the frame is the previous frame and then half the screen is going to be the next frame. And so that leads to a tear because there's been movement or something um, and it can be really messy. It doesn't show up that much at really high frame rates and really high refresh rates because the amount of the tear is really small because of how fast it's going. But that's beside the point. So first, I want to talk about, like I said, what happens when you have none of these settings on. So imagine that red square, a red rectangle on the left is the previous refresh of the monitor screen. So that is a full perfect frame. The refresh rate synced up with the GPU and you got a perfect clear frame with no screen tearing. Um, and then on the next refresh of the monitor, assuming this is a 60 hertz monitor, so it refreshes 60 times per second, if your GPU is only putting out 50 FPS, then this yellow part is going to be a partially rendered frame that is now sent to the screen. So the screen doesn't care what it's getting or when it's getting it if you don't have any of those sync settings on. And it's just going to display what it has. And since it's the GPU is only rendering at 50 FPS, it doesn't have a full complete frame yet. So that's why you'll get this yellow rectangle on the screen. And this difference in color here is the, the red is the previous frame. The yellow is the current frame. And that line in between the two is going to be a screen tear. 
So that's how you, you can see how this happens below um, 60 hertz. This is a simplification, but um, it's a good way to understand how this stuff works at its base level. Um, so below, even if you're below your monitor's refresh rate, so the monitor's refresh rate is 60 hertz, if you're running at 50 FPS, you're still going to get screen tearing because it only is going to have partial frames even when it uh, refreshes the next time. So then the other example is 110 FPS. So over here on the right, we have the example of 110 FPS. Your GPU is running at 110 FPS, but your monitor is only 60 hertz refresh rate. So what happens is the red frame is now completely gone because in that time, you had 110 frames per second rendering. So you had one full frame, the yellow frame in the back here, was fully rendered, replaced the red frame, and then your GPU is moving so fast that it's already rendered, you know, 80% of the next frame, which is what this green rectangle represents. So this is why even with um, a refresh rate of like 60 hertz, so the monitor in all, th all of those two situations uh, is 60 hertz. So some might say, well, it doesn't matter if you're running at exactly 60 FPS or if you're running at 300 FPS. It doesn't matter in terms of um, input lag. That's not true because... Like I showed here, the example on the right, you get more of the next frame the higher over the refresh rate that you go. So it's always better to have more FPS, uh, even if it's over your uh, monitor refresh rate. So what are the differences between VSync, G-Sync, and FreeSync? Uh, basically, VSync is a much older technology. It's just literally controlled by the GPU alone, from my understanding. Um, there's no communication between the monitor and the GPU. It's just simply the GPU saying, okay, it's a 60 hertz refresh rate, so I need to hold up my frames and match that 60, uh, 60 frames per second. And what that does is it causes um, some really, really bad input lag. So I would pretty much never recommend you have VSync on. Um, it's okay to turn on if you have G-Sync or FreeSync on separately, but that's not what we're talking about. I'm talking about VSync by itself. I would never, ever recommend using VSync just because the input lag is, is really bad. And as I've talked about, that's a really important thing. I would never use that for a competitive... Uh, reaction-based sort of game. Um, so G-Sync is a newer technology. It's been out for, I don't know, probably 10 years now. Um, but it's from NVIDIA, and the monitor and the PC actively talk to each other um, through the connection, and uh, it, it just, the, as soon as the GPU renders a frame, it sends it straight to the monitor, and the monitor displays it in its entirety. There's no partial um, frame rendering or anything like that happening. It's literally just when the GPU finishes a full frame, it sends it to the monitor, the monitor displays it. Uh, it has very minimal input lag compared to um, VSync. It still has a little bit of added input lag compared to if you had G-Sync completely off. And that's partially because of that effect I talked about previously where you know if, if, if it's rendering the frame when it's partially done, rather than waiting for the whole frame to finish, you know sometimes you're gonna get information on your screen that you wouldn't have gotten as quickly if it waited for that whole frame to finish. So it leads to tearing if you have it off, but you do get slightly better input lag um, with it off as well. Um, G-Sync's completely fine to use for competitive games. It's, it's a minimal uh, increase in input lag. FreeSync is basically the same thing as G-Sync. Um, I wrote, I just copy pasted there, so it still says NVIDIA Tech. It's supposed to say uh, AMD Tech here, so it's basically a cheaper version of G-Sync from my understanding, and they're almost interchangeable at this point. They both work the same. They both work really well, uh, and they do the exact same thing, so I'm not going to repeat everything I said about G-Sync. It's just the same thing, um, but more for AMD. And now, recently, G-Sync has started adopting the ability to be used on FreeSync compatible monitors. So they're kind of interchangeable, like I said. Um, they're both fine to use for uh, competitive games. So now we're going to get into the actual part of the video where I talk about uh, actual settings you can change on your PC to reduce input lag. And I want to talk about where this video came from, why the idea for this happened. Um, I tested, I got a new... Xbox Elite Series 2 controller and I was curious how it compared in terms of input lag compared to my mouse. So I just did some tests in Caldera and I noticed that my input lag was really, really high. So I got an average of 54 milliseconds with the Bluetooth Elite Series 2 controller with no overclock, um, 48 milliseconds when it was wired, and then my mouse was 48.6. So basically the same as a wired Elite Series 2 controller. And that's really high. I was running at 240 FPS, 240 hertz, and my input lag was just way, way higher than I was thinking it should be because I remembered in the past testing things, I would usually get around 30 milliseconds of input lag, you know, 25 to 30. Um, so that's why I started remembering all these things about um, limiting your GPU usage to reduce input lag. And that's what led to this video. Okay, so now we're finally getting to basically the whole reason I made this video. Those other things were just stuff I wanted to talk about that kind of relate to input lag. 
Um, but the render queue is the big one that we can affect with in-game settings, out-of-game settings, um, and even some programs that do some frame limiting and things like that. Uh, I'm not going to try to explain how NVIDIA Reflex works, which is basically something that works to reduce that render queue time for NVIDIA graphics cards or Radeon Anti-Lag, which is the same technology but for AMD graphics cards. I have a 6900 XT um, by Radeon AMD, and um, I have you know, obviously I have Anti-Lag turned on. Um, so I'm going to show a clip of a guy from NVIDIA talking about uh, what NVIDIA Reflex is slash uh, AMD Anti-Lag is. In typical graphics intensive games, the CPU queues up work in a render queue so the GPU always stays fed. While this helps maximize frame rate, it also increases latency as frames are waiting in line to be rendered. The reflex low latency mode dynamically reduces the render queue by keeping the CPU perfectly in sync with the GPU. This mode also reduces the back pressure on the CPU, enabling games to sample mouse input at the last possible moment, further reducing system latency. So before I jump into all the data I took and my results from all this stuff, I want to say that in general, if your game is GPU limited, so your CPU is going to be working hard, your GPU is going to be working hard, but certain games require more CPU usage, certain games re require more GPU usage, and your individual system can affect all of this. So before I talk about this stuff, the FPS limits that I'm about to go into that made a huge difference for me are because my system, I have a 5950X and a 6900 XT, is very... Uh, GPU bound. So GPU is sitting at 100% usage, CPU is sitting at like 40% usage. So the CPU is not working nearly as hard as it's capable of, but the GPU is working as hard as it possibly can when I have unlimited FPS, like no FPS cap. That is where doing a frame rate limit comes in handy because um, if you limit that GPU usage down, it can kind of balance out the CPU usage and the GPU usage and those Q, those, those rendered frames are not sitting in queue instead they're just going directly from you know from the gpu to the monitor so i don't know all the technical details behind this um, i'm just trying to give you guys an overview of what i found the best settings to be and just a basic understanding of how all this stuff works because honestly i don't understand it all myself i just know what the numbers came out as so this is really really useful if you have a powerful rig with both a powerful cpu and a powerful gpu and you look at your gpu usage again i got these numbers from optimum tech um, he said that if your GPU is over about 85% usage, you're going to start to see really significant gains in input lag um, if you do a frame rate limit. So that's the whole point of this. Let's jump into the input lag tests now. So I did a bunch of different tests with a bunch of different settings. I tried to kind of color code the settings a little bit down here for you guys so it would be easier to read. Um, basically, because I'm a streamer and I'm recording this video on a 2PC setup, I did all of my testing with um, just my standard setup, which means that my main display for my gaming PC is being cloned to my second PC. Um, I just put that there so it's, you have that information. Every single test, it was cloning to my capture card because of my setup. Um, I did a bunch of tests full screen, a few tests full screen borderless. Uh, I did various FPS limits. So this is the big thing that this video is about is FPS limiting. So in game, there's an FPS limiter. And you can also get external ones like Riva Tuner. So Riva Tuner comes with MSI Afterburner if you've ever done any overclocking or anything with your GPU. Really, really simple to use. I'll show you how to use that in this video. Um, but I did various tests with Riva Tuner set at different FPS limits. And what that does is makes it so your GPU simply, um, the game will not render at a higher number of FPS than that limit. So even though my PC can push 240 FPS or higher in certain areas, um, I, I want to restrict my GPU usage from 100% down to something lower than that because of what we just talked about where those frames don't get stuck in that render queue and they can just be displayed immediately, which, which dramatically reduces input lag. So if I limit it to like 180 FPS, my GPU usage drops down to like 70%. Um, and basically what you want to target with this is you want to set an FPS limit that is close to the minimum that you're going to get on the map. So I'll probably end up actually limiting to like 165 or 170 because in certain areas of Caldera, I can drop all the way down to about 160, um, but the vast majority of the places, if I limit to like 170, um, that'll be dramatically below what my system can push, which means I'll be getting those really good um, input lag numbers that are much lower than if I just let it do whatever it wants to do. Um, so anyway, let's jump into these actual tests. So the, the leftmost test here, um, this is capture card, cloning, full screen, no FPS limit, so my GPU is doing anything it can do, pushing as hard as it can, free sync is on, Radeon anti-lag was off. And then I noted here that my FPS for this test was way above the refresh rate of my monitor. So I was in a high FPS area. I was probably pushing 260, 270 FPS. 
Um, that was important to note just so you know that uh, that doesn't play any part in the input lag. And you can see that even though I was pushing 240 FPS, hitting my frame rate cap of my, my monitor, the refresh rate of my monitor, I still got an average of almost 49 milliseconds of input lag. That's pretty bad. So the next thing I did was all I did was turned on Radeon Anti-Lag. This is the same thing as NVIDIA Reflex. Simple setting to just pop on. And if you're doing zero FPS limit, you should definitely have either Radeon Anti-Lag on or NVIDIA Reflex. That will give you just an instant bump in uh, input lag and make it just much better. So instantly that dropped my input lag down by about 10 milliseconds. Um, so yeah, if you're not going to use an FPS limit, then 100% you should have either anti-lag on or NVIDIA Reflex. Next up, I wanted to test that against just a straight up FPS limiter. So I used Riva Tuner from MSI Afterburner, um, set my FPS limit to 180, and then I turned off anti-lag because I wanted to compare to that. And with that, I found more consistent. So I've got the error bars on here. Those are my testing errors. So standard deviation is how big the uh, those, those little error bars are. And then you can see that this one was very tight, very consistent, 39 millisecond, milliseconds of input lag consistently. So even better than 240 FPS, 60 FPS lower, I was still getting less input lag from when I clicked my mouse to when the weapon fired on screen and more consistent. So right off the bat, I was like, okay, limiting to FPS so far looks like the, the direction I want to go. But then I just tested a bunch of other things. I did the exact same test that I just did, but with 120 FPS limit instead of 180. And you can see that that bumped it up by 10 milliseconds with much more inconsistency. So for my rig, I wouldn't go that low. Um, it's going to be dependent on your individual system, kind of what FPS you want to limit at. Again, you want to limit to basically like the minimum you're going to see anywhere on the map. So at any point during the map, you're going to have less than 100% GPU usage. So if you get 180 FPS in at the edge of the map looking out in the ocean, but you only get 110 FPS when you're in like, you know, airfield or um, whatever the city part of the map's called, I can't even remember at this point, but um, if you're down at like 110 there, then you probably want to set your FPS limit to around 110. Next up, I wanted to try the in-game FPS limiter. So the in-game FPS limiter is uh, weird for me at least. I've heard that it's not this way for other people, but um, if I set the in-game FPS limiter to anywhere between 145 and like 165, it would lock my game at 168 FPS, even though... Uh, that's not what the setting was set to. And then as soon as I went over like 165 as the setting, it would lock to 200 FPS. So there's just weird things going on with the in-game limiter. Um, but I saw pretty much identical to results at 168 FPS with the in-game limiter as I did with Riva Tuner at 180 FPS. So again, still dramatically better than that 48.6 uh, that I saw with no FPS limit whatsoever. Um, again, I did the same thing, but I turned on Radeon Anti-Lag and again, Anti-lag and NVIDIA Reflex are both really for GPU bound scenarios. They're all about reducing that render queue um, waiting time. So anytime you're like limiting your FPS, having anti-lag on or having NVIDIA Reflex on really is not going to make much difference. So you don't need to do both those things at once. You can. It doesn't cause a problem. It just doesn't actually help that much. And then the next setting was going back to Riva Tuner. Again, this is proving the same thing as this 180 FPS test or 168 FPS limit except this time I used Reboot Tuner with Radeon Anti-Lag on instead of off like the previous test. And you can see it was slightly higher, so 43.3 versus 39.2 with Anti-Lag on. And again, that's because it's just not it's not made for, for non-GPU bound scenarios. So it's fine to have it on all the time, but um, it's just not going to help you. And then the last three tests I did, um, this kind of brings in some monitor settings into play. So for these last three, I turned off FreeSync. So FreeSync was off for all three of these versus on before. And I got a lot of questions. This was confusing. I should have clarified this in my tweet. But a lot of people were asking about full screen borderless. Like, like these numbers are really good. And the thing that they saw that was different was that I was full screen borderless instead of full screen. And instead of FreeSync off. But really, the reason that I did full screen borderless is just because, for some reason, when I turned FreeSync off, I could not get the game to run smoothly in full screen. But as soon as I went full screen borderless, it was perfectly smooth. In general, if you can run full screen, you're going to want to run full screen. I, in just my experience in Warzone, I can get about 10 frames per second more um, with full screen than full screen borderless. So I would still recommend full screen if it runs smooth for you. I didn't, I didn't do that because I wanted to. I did that because I had to to make the game run smooth. So I did the same test here, full screen borderless with FreeSync off. Um, I set my monitor. So your monitor or TV is going to have certain settings. We'll talk about those in a second. But in general, it'll have uh, like response time settings you can for like my samsung g7 there's like fast faster fastest and 
Um, generally you're going to want to balance those with some overshoot. So like the really fast ones. So if I set it to like fastest on my screen, um, sometimes you'll get some overshoot because it's trying to, uh, it's trying to make those response times faster by, you know, pumping more voltage into the actual pixels themselves. And that can uh, lead to some, some things that make it kind of hard to see players and, and make motion look weird and stuff like that. So usually you want to go like one below whatever your fastest setting is on your monitor. But on this G7, I was able to do fastest and it doesn't have any of that artifacting or, um, or ghosting or anything. Um, so just check those settings out on your monitor specifically. And if you're on a TV, um, usually most TVs will have a game mode setting now and you definitely want turn game mode setting on because it, it's going to be called something different on all, all different TVs, but you should be able to go into your TV settings and find that. And it usually will, will reduce the processing time of the TV and that will dramatically reduce your input lag if you're on a TV. So anyway, back to the actual numbers with anti-lag on full screen borderless free sync off. Um, when free sync is on, I was not able to change these settings for response time. So that's part of part of what changed this number for me. Part of it is FreeSync being off because like I talked about earlier, FreeSync being off, if it doesn't wait for that full frame to be rendered before it renders, you're gonna get you know half a frame sometimes, but that half a frame is gonna be there faster than that full frame would have been there. So you're gonna get half a screen of information to your eyes faster than you would have with FreeSync on or G-Sync on. Um, so turning it off can actually improve the input lag slightly um, but it's not that big of a deal, and if the tearing, screen tearing is an issue for you, then I would, you, you don't, I would just wouldn't turn it off. It's maybe not worth it to have that better input lag. Uh, but this was one of the best results I had. Um, the only one that was a little bit better was using the fastest response time instead of fastest plus motion blur, blur reduction on my monitor. This got it all the way down to 30.2 milliseconds, changing all these settings. Reva tuner set to 180 FPS limit, free sync off, anti-lag on, and full screen borderless. This was... This is almost 20 milliseconds faster than my original setup and just that's a dramatic difference so I, I, I when i tweeted this out i said so maybe you're like a 30 year old gamer and you want to have your react you know as you get older your reaction time gets slower so if you want to be able to compete with a 10 or a 20 year old when you're 30 and you've gained 10 years of increased reaction time i looked up some scientific studies and it was like between you know one and three milliseconds of reaction time slower every single year so over 10 years between 10 and 30 milliseconds slower well i just instantly got 10 years younger by going from 50 milliseconds of input lag down to 30 obviously that's <laughs> it's not a perfect analogy but you get what i'm saying this is a dramatic increase or a dramatic decrease in the overall input lag Really quickly before I summarize all this information and tell you what I'm personally going to use and what I would recommend other people using, I want to talk about Reva Tuner real quick. So if you download MSI Afterburner, just Google it. It's really quick. Um, it'll ask you while you're installing if you also want to install Reva Tuner. So Reva Tuner is not something that's going to pop up when you open Afterburner, but it will be in your tray. So if you go to your tray, it'll be this little, uh, little monitor with a little 60 FPS screen on it. You double click that, it'll open up. This is Reva Tuner, and then right here is the frame rate limit. Simple as that, you literally just click this, type in what you want your frame rate limit to be, and hit enter, and then your game will be restricted to that. Be sure you have the in-game setting to, you know, maximum, so like 300 FPS. That way they don't yeah, interfere with each other. Just only use one or the other. In my case, I'm gonna use Reva Tuner just because it seems to work better for my rig. I don't know why my rig has issues, um, but either one should be fine for most people. This is a ton of information to try to get into one video. And I'm not an expert on it, but I just know my own testing results. And I do know a lot about the stuff. Um, but I'm going to link some more things down below that you should definitely check out. But anyway, if you've been paying attention, there's basically two different routes that you can take. You can go for the minimum input lag option, which is going to be a lower frame rate because you have to use a frame rate limit, limiter. Um, but it is going to reduce your input lag. It's also going to have screen tearing because you're not going to be using G-Sync or FreeSync. The other option is to use G-Sync or FreeSync. Uh, and that is if you can't stand tearing and you just want to pump out as many frames as possible, um, that is a better option as far as the smoothness of vision as you're like, you know, making quick movements because there's no tearing and um, you can push out a higher frame rate since you don't have to have a frame rate limiter. But for me, the most important thing in my personal opinion is the input lag. So I'm going to be using the option on the left. Let's go through both of these. So minimum input lag. For system input lag to be minimized, you should turn off your FreeSync setting or G-Sync, depending on if you have 
uh, either one of those things. Turn off Radeon Anti-Lag or NVIDIA Reflex or low latency mode. It's also called low, low latency mode in the actual NVIDIA control panel. And then you're gonna wanna set an FPS limit. Again, that's gonna be set either three, through Riva Tuner, which I just showed, or through the game itself. Um, my experience with the Warzone frame limiter is not good, so I use Riva Tuner. Um, in general, a really good baked in FPS limiter into the game itself should technically be better than Riva Tuner, but in this case, I don't think it's better than Riva Tuner. Um, so basically you're going to set that FPS limit to approximately the low, lowest FPS you'll see anywhere in Caldera. Um, and then that allows your PC to, your, your GPU to not run at 100% usage. It'll be anywhere between probably like 65% and 100% usage when you're in one of those areas where that FPS limit is the same as your minimum FPS. Um, and what that does is just gives you dramatically better input lag times because... Uh, I talked about this, but because of the, the render queue, it just clears up that render queue uh, and things can be displayed to the screen right away. Um, and like, like my testing showed, you can be up to 10 to 15 milliseconds lower input lag than G-Sync and FreeSync, and that's dramatic. I mean, that's a, that's a big amount of input lag reduction that makes everything feel snappier, um, and it literally gives you a 10 or 15 millisecond advantage over anyone else in terms of what you see versus what they see. Again, that comes at a cost of having fr screen tearing and less smooth like motion because your FPS is going to always be limited but in some cases that's a good thing because if you have a consistent uh, consistent FPS rather than an inconsistent FPS even if it's displaying the frame right away um, it can be better to have really consistent frame times it just makes the game feel more smooth rather than using G-Sync or FreeSync where the amount of FPS is changing all the time so the other option is leaving G-Sync or FreeSync on and that's if you can't stand the tearing um, basically the ideal settings for G-Sync and FreeSync are listed here. I will link where I got this. Um, this is from Blurbusters. It's a super reputable website, amazing website. Um, and they have a huge 15 page guide on the best settings for G-Sync. Um, so you should definitely go check that out. If you're really interested in diving into this, they have probably the best information out there on this, but basically you want to turn G-Sync or FreeSync on, um, for both your monitor slash TV and your graphics card in the software. And then set VSync to on in game. This is actually something that I didn't cover at all in this video, but you are supposed to turn VSync on if you're using G-Sync or FreeSync. Um, it doesn't do what I talked about earlier. That was only for VSync being on by itself, giving you dramatic in, in input lag increases. So when you have G-Sync or FreeSync on, you can, you should turn VSync on. Again, I'm not going to cover why, but that 15 page thing I'm going to link below will explain that to you if you want to learn more about that. Um, full screen is, like I said, always the best option. That's true for both these different uh you know paths you can take minimum input input lag and g-sync slash free sync if you can run full screen and it's smooth you should use that and then for the next setting uh even though you've got v-sync on g-sync on or free sync on you still want to use a frame rate limiter so in general reva tuner frame rate limiter is the industry standard unless the built-in one to the game has a better one which in this case it does not so i would use reva tuner again and you're supposed to set that limit to 3 FPS below your monitor's refresh rate. So if you have a 144 hertz monitor, you want to set that frame rate limit to 141 FPS. If you have a 240 hertz monitor, you want to set it to 237 uh, FPS. And all of this is just in the interest of getting that input lag down. There's reasons for every single setting on here, and they will be in that, that Blurbusters link in the video description. You also would like, you should also turn on uh, Radeon Anti-Lag and NVIDIA Reflex. Um, it's also called, like I said, low latency mode. That just, again, reduces that input lag a little bit since your GPU is going to be 100% usage all the time when you have G-Sync or FreeSync on, uh, unless you're over that frame rate limit. But um, in, in Warzone, you're very rarely going to be over that frame rate limit. So you would still want these settings to be on. All right, I know that was an insanely long video with an insanely large amount of information. Uh, if you guys really want to dive deep into this, definitely go follow Optimum Tech, go follow Battle Nonsense, and also check out Blurbusters. They have all kinds of articles on there about all this stuff. Um, in general, input lag is really, really important, and you want to reduce it as much as possible. Even if it's only, you know, one to two milliseconds that you're getting from overclocking your controller or something like that. If you do, like, three or four things that are only one or two milliseconds, um, that's going to give you an extra 10 milliseconds, which is almost like 10% of your reaction time over the person that you're, you know, competing against. So these settings can really add up and really make a big difference, and that's why I wanted to make this video. I'll be swapping to the minimum input lag setting uh, on the left here, and... I mean, it felt great when I was using it, so uh, I just hope it helps you out. I hope you learned a lot, 
and I will see you guys all in the next video.